Hello, hello, it's Seiji and today I will be doing another book review, this time for When We Cease to Understand the World by the Chilean author Benjamin Labatut. So this was translated actually from the Spanish to the English by Adrian Nathan West. I would like to kindly thank Pushkin Press for sending this book. When did they send this? Like a really long time ago, back in June last year. <laughs> Um, yes, thank you so much. They are one of my favorite publishers because they have a great selection of world literature, both classic and contemporary. So I'll leave a link to their website because they just have an amazing selection. So yeah, anyway, I've spoken about this book before. I read it back in June and absolutely loved it. And I think I mentioned it in one of the last wrap-ups I've ever done. But yeah, I still wanted to do a single review video for it because it definitely was one of my favorites of 2020. I would also like to note that I have put content notes in the description box for anyone who is interested. So When We Cease to Understand the World is a piece of literature that mixes both fiction and non-fiction in order to create a captivating story about several scientists who have left a significant mark on the world, essentially changing the course of history and society as a whole. So throughout the book, you'll learn about a host of different discoveries and inventions, all within the realms of mathematics, physics and chemistry. And as a total science geek myself and history geek, this was just right up my alley. The book consists of five short stories, each focusing on about one or two different scientists. So these are people such as Alexander Grothendieck, Erwin Schrödinger, Fritz Haber, uh, Werner Heisenberg. And if you couldn't already hear from their names, most of these people come from German speaking countries. So since this is such a short book, it has less than 200 pages. And because I think this book is best experienced without knowing what's going to happen. I thought it would be nice for this review only to discuss the first story called Prussian Blue. So Prussian Blue starts on the eve of the Nuremberg trials, which were the tribunals that were held after World War II in order to prosecute war criminals. Now, we are informed about the medical examination of Hermann Göring, who was a Nazi leader. Apparently, his fingers were stained a ferocious red because of his addiction to dihydrocodine, which he took more than 100 pills of every single day. Apparently, many soldiers within the German army were given drugs such as these towards the end of the war in order to keep on fighting despite them nearing defeat. We are also told about how the German soldiers under the orders of Hitler started to destroy everything of value in order to leave nothing behind for the Allied forces. And so this wave of destruction eventually added to the wave of panic and suicides that swept through Germany during the final months of the war. A wave of suicides swept through Germany in the final months of the war. In April 1945 alone, 3,800 people killed themselves in Berlin. The inhabitants of the small town of Demin, to the north of the capital, some three hours away, fell prey to the collective panic when the retreating German troops destroyed the bridges leading west, leaving them stranded on their peninsula, surrounded by three rivers and defenseless before the dreaded onslaught of the Red Army. Hundreds of men, women and children took their lives over the course of three days. Whole families walked into the waters of the Tollensen, tied together with ropes around their waists, as if to play a gruesome game of tug-of-war. 
The smallest children weighed down by their school bags laden with rocks. The chaos was such that the Russian troops, who had up to then devoted themselves to looting homes, burning buildings and draping without a D women, received orders to put a stop to the epidemic of suicides. Now, this is page 10 and at that point I was already in full shock because I had known about the suicides but it never really registered in the way that it did when I was actually reading this passage and I think that really goes to show how strong fiction can be as a tool for storytelling. The next passage, for instance, focuses on one particular woman trying to commit suicide and the way it's written gave me absolute chills. On three separate occasions, they had to cut down a woman who tried to hang herself from the branches of a massive oak tree in her garden, at the roots of which she had already buried her three children after lacing their cookies, a final treat with rat poison. The thing I think that really set me off when it came to this particular passage was the line, a final treat, because it reminded me of the Brothers Grimm's fairy tales, the originals that are far scarier than the the cookie cutter versions that you'll see on Disney. I also felt that the imagery that this passage incited in my mind was very affecting because I was just thinking about this massive oak tree and these soldiers trying to get this lady down whilst they're standing not knowing on top of the graves of the children she just killed and it's just very rough to read in my opinion. Now, after a while, the story shifts from various suicides to one in particular, namely that one of Göring, the Nazi that I mentioned earlier. Göring decided to commit suicide by biting on a cyanide pill and the book uses this as a jumping point to talk about how these pills were used at the end of the war and how Hitler had one himself and also how cyanide itself works. Hitler became so convinced that his dosage had been tampered with that he chose to test its effectiveness on his beloved Blondie, a German shepherd that had accompanied him to the Führer bunker where he slept at the foot of his bed enjoying privileges of all kinds. The Führer preferred killing his pet to letting her fall into the hands of Russian troops who had already surrounded Berlin and were inching closer to his subterranean refuge by the minute, but he was too cowardly to do it himself. He asked his personal doctor to break one of the capsules in the animal's mouth. The dog, who had just given birth to four puppies, died instantly when the minuscule cyanide molecule formed by one atom of nitrogen, one of carbon and one of potassium entered her bloodstream and cut off her breath. The effects of cyanide are so swift that there is but one historical account of its flavour, left behind in the early 21st century by M.P. Prasad an Indian goldsmith, 32 years old, who managed to write three lines after swallowing it. Doctors, potassium cyanide, I have tasted it. It burns the tongue and tastes acrid, said the note they found next to his body in the hotel room he had rented for the purpose of taking his own life. A cyanide-based gas called Cyclone B was used during the war to kill Jewish people in concentration camps and this gas stained the walls of the gas chambers a colour blue, more precisely the colour Prussian blue. And the latter half of this information again serves as 
another jumping point to talk about the creation of the Prussian blue pigment, which in the art industry replaced the pigment that was created using lapis lazuli. And I know that all you fellow Minecrafters know exactly what that is. Either way, we're told about its use in Peter van der Werf's The Graflegging van Christus, The Entombment of Christ, Van Gogh's The Sterrenacht, Starry Night, as well as Hokusai's Kanagawa Okinami Ura, Great Wave. So yes, all these stellar paintings were created using Prussian blue. Shifting back to cyanide, we learn about Alan Turing's death due to possible cyanide poisoning, and we get to know the little quirks of his personality. Good morning, it's Editing Seiji here, and I completely forgot to tell you who Alan Turing actually was, so I'm just going to read the first part of his Wikipedia page. Alan Matheson... Shoot. Alan Matheson... Tur... <laughs> Alan Matheson Turing was an English mathematician, computer scientist, logician, logician, cryptanalysist, philosopher and theoretical biologist. Turing was highly influential in the development of theoretical computer science, providing a formalization of the concepts of algorithm and computation with the Turing machine, which can be considered a model of a general purpose computer. Turing is widely considered to be the father of theoretical computer science and artificial intelligence. It bothered him that his office mates used his favourite mug, so he chained it to a radiator with a padlock. It hangs there to this very day. In 1940, when all of Britain supposed the Germans were soon to invade, Turing used his savings to buy two enormous silver ingots and buried them in a forest close to his work. He drew up an elaborate coded map to recall their location, but hid them so well that he could not find them at the war's end, even with the aid of a metal detector. In his free time, he liked to play Desert Island, a game that consisted in crafting for himself the largest possible variety of household products. He made his own detergent, soap and an insecticide so potent it decimated his neighbour's gardens. During the war, he rode to his office in the Cypher School in Bletchley Park on a bicycle with a defective chain that he refused to repair. Rather than taking it to the workshop, he would calculate the numbers of revolutions the chain would withstand and would jump off and adjust its seconds before it came loose. In spring, when his allergy to pollen became unbearable, he would cover his face with a gas mask. The British government had distributed them throughout the population at the start of the war, sowing panic among those who saw him pass and imagined an attack was imminent. Now this is an aspect of the book that I really enjoyed because for some of these scientists we get an insight on their personality and it makes the reader come just a bit closer to history or to the, the character, the historical figure, if that makes any sense. The last part of the anecdote about Turing that I just recited is cleverly used as an introduction to talk about gas masks and how they were used during the First World War. The first gas attack in history overwhelmed the French troops entrenched near the small town of Ypres in Belgium. I actually went there after I won this poetry contest at my secondary school and so I got to see the trenches that were still there and we went to several graves and we attended one of the memorial services and it was really intense and it heavily impacted me as a kid. But moving on with this passage. When they awoke on the morning of Thursday, April 22nd, 1915, the soldiers saw an enormous greenish cloud creeping towards them across no man's land. Twice as high as a man and as dense as winter fog, it stretched from one end of the horizon to the other, as far as the eye could see. The leaves withered on the trees as it passed, birds fell dead from the sky, it tinged the pasture land a sickly metallic colour. 
A scent like pineapple and bleach filled the throats of the soldiers when the gas reacted with the mucus of their lungs, forming hydrochloric acid. As the cloud pooled in the trenches, hundreds of men fell to the ground convulsing, choking on their own phlegm, yellow mucus bubbling in their mouths, their skin turning blue from lack of oxygen. The weatherman was right. It was a beautiful day. The sun was shining. Where there was grass, it was blazing green. We should have been going on a picnic, not doing what we were going to do, wrote Willy Siebert, one of the soldiers who opened the 6,000 canisters of chlorine gas the Germans released that morning at Ypres. We suddenly heard the French yelling. In less than a minute, they started with the most rifle and machine gun fire that I had ever heard. Every field artillery gun, every machine gun, every rifle that the French possessed must have been firing. I had never heard such a noise. The hail of bullets going over our heads was unbelievable, but it was not stopping the gas. The wind kept moving the gas towards the French lines. We heard the cows bawling and the horses screaming. The French kept on shooting. They couldn't possibly see what they were shooting at. In about 15 minutes, the gunfire petered out. After half an hour, only occasional shots. Then everything was quiet again. In a while it had cleared and we walked past the empty gas bottles. What we saw was total death. Nothing was alive. All the animals had come out of their holes to die. Dead rabbits, moles, rats and mice were everywhere. The smell of the gas was still in the air. It hung on the few bushes which were left. When we got to the French lines, the trenches were empty, but in a half mile, the bodies of French soldiers were everywhere. It was unbelievable. Then we saw there were some English. You could see where men had clawed at their faces and throats trying to breathe. Some had shot themselves. The horses, still in the stables, cows, chickens, everything, all were dead. Everything, even the insects, were dead. Soon after this passage, we actually learn that this attack was overseen by the German-Jewish scientist named Fritz Haber, who chemists might know from the Haber process. Haber had actually previously tested this gas together with his wife and some of his students but it almost backfired on them because the wind all of a sudden turned. And so the gas started heading towards their way and eventually one of the students failed to get away fast enough and Haber's wife Clara witnessed that. Clara watched him die on the ground, writhing as if set upon by an army of ravenous ants. When Haber returned victorious from the massacre of Ypres, Clara accused him of perverting science by devising a method for exterminating human beings on an industrial scale. Haber ignored her. For him, war was war and death was death, regardless of the means of its infliction. He used his two days furlough to invite his friends to a party that lasted until dawn and at its end his wife walked down to the garden, took off her shoes and shot herself in the chest with her husband's service revolver. She had bled to death in the arms of their 13-year-old son who had run downstairs when he heard the shot. Eventually, Haber was declared a war criminal in 1918 and so he was forced to flee Germany. At the same time, however, he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for the Haber process that I previously mentioned. To give a bit of context, the Haber process was an artificial nitrogen fixation process which addressed the shortage in fertilizer that was actually threatening to incite a global famine at that time. 
So in that way, Haber managed to save millions of lives by making what is now considered to be the most significant discovery of the 20th century. So in that way, Haber actually managed to save millions of lives by essentially making what is considered to be the most important chemical discovery of the 20th century. So the last passage that I wanted to recite from Prussian Blue is the one about the run-up to the Second World War. Haber had converted to Christianity at 25 years old. He identified so closely with his country and its customs that his sons knew nothing of their ancestry until he told them they would have to flee Germany. I previously stated that Fritz Haber was German-Jewish. So, you know, in the run-up to the Second World War, of course, you had a huge outflux of Jewish people trying to flee the regime. Haber escaped after them and sought asylum in England, but his British colleagues scorned him, aware of his instrumental role in chemical warfare. He had to leave the island not long after arriving. Thenceforth, he would travel from country to country in the hope of reaching Palestine, his chest gripped with pain, his arteries incapable of delivering sufficient blood to his heart. He died in Basel in 1934, clutching the canister of nitroglycerin he needed to dilate his coronary vessels, not knowing that, years later, the Nazis would use in their gas chambers the pesticide he had helped create to murder his half-sister, his brother-in-law, his nephews and countless other Jews who died hunkered down, muscles cramping, skin covered with red and green spots, bleeding from their ears, spitting foam from their mouths, the young ones crushing the children and the elderly as they attempted to scale the heap of naked bodies and breathe a few more minutes, a few more seconds because Cyclone B tended to pool on the floor after being dropped through hatches in the roof. When ventilators had diffused the cloud of cyanide, the bodies were dragged to enormous ovens and incinerated. The ashes were buried in pit graves, dumped in rivers and ponds, or scattered as fertilizer in the surrounding fields. I had such a hard time reading this passage because I was just in utter shock of it. I had no words. And I think what this story shows is that all these discoveries that we're making now, we have absolutely no idea what the consequences are that these things are bringing along only until they come to fruition. And I think that that is something very important to keep in mind and be aware of, I think. I got this book back in June and it's this story is still very hard for me to process. I think one of the main things that Prussian Blue really shows is that we can absolutely not know what the consequences of our inventions will be in both short term and long term. I mean, if you think about it, the process that Haber invented ended up saving millions of lives, but at the same time, it also ended those of millions. And the, the fact also that those... <laughs> It's hard even to say, like the fact that those bodies were used as fertilizer and how Haber's invention had a part in the demise of his family made this story come full circle in 
the two most harrowing ways. Prussian Blue by far is the most morbid story in this collection and it feels very awkward and weird saying that this was my favourite story but I mean that in terms of storytelling, in terms of the way in which Labatut managed to merge non-fiction and fiction and the transitions that he made throughout the story and the techniques of storytelling that he used. I think the story, despite being incredibly gruesome, also shows Labatut's skill in storytelling and I think that's what I meant with it being my favourite story. So yeah, I don't know. I feel really... I don't even know how to describe my feelings towards this story and it's been almost a year now. So the last thing that I wanted to mention was actually the last story which is called The Night Gardener and I think it's also the shortest one. It is told by a person who lives in Chile and in this town there is a man who they refer to as the night gardener because he takes care of his garden at night and he tells the narrator of this story that he used to be a mathematician but he quit after he encountered the work of Gorthen Dirk who was like this amazingly talented mathematician who you'll also meet in this story. But yes, then a short passage follows and it gently connects all of the previous stories that were written in the collection and I thought that that was a very brilliant way of ending the book and really bringing it all together. So yes, this was my review of When We Cease to Understand the World. A lot of tough subjects, which is I think the reason as to why it took me so long to actually review this book, but despite that I still believe that it's a book worth the read. So as always, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy the work that I make for this channel, perhaps consider supporting me by gifting me a coffee or joining my Patreon. I have a classic literature book club where we read one classic from anywhere in the world every single month and we discuss it on Discord. I also have a Discord where we discuss all sorts of things, knitting, skating, reading, whatever you fancy. And yeah, that's about it. You can also support me by just liking, subscribing, commenting and hitting the bell button. And like I previously said, thank you so, so much for watching and I hope to see you in another video. Cheers.